when I was with the John Fugong. There were times when I'd be staying with him at Bangkok, fixing his tea and basically sitting in one corner of the room while he was teaching other people. And I got to hear a lot of things, different people's problems as I came to the meditation and how a John Fuang would solve them. And it was interesting that as people were starting out, they had a wide variety of problems all over the place. But as the practice progressed, they got more and more similar. And finally, everybody, those who got to the point where they focused on the breath and the breath energy was filling the body and the breathing stopped. From that point on, everything followed the same steps. There wasn't much room for personal expression as the practice developed. This is one thing we have to keep in mind, that the, the significance of the practice is not so much in doing something that no one else has done, or doing it in a new way. It's in realizing that this is the best thing you can do with your mind, and being, being willing to train yourself, so to submit to the training. It's not simply a matter of obeying lessons. After all, there is room for using your ingenuity as you face problems in the meditation and other aspects of the practice. But it's ingenuity aimed at a particular end, and as a common end for all of us. To find a happiness that is harmless and a happiness that doesn't disappoint, a happiness that doesn't change. So as you're looking for significance, this is where it lies, in training the mind so that it can be harmless. There's not much news out there about harmless people, and yet they're the really important people in the world, the ones who know that the search for happiness has to be responsible. You can't just take your pleasures where you find them or where you want to find them. You have to think about the consequences. So few people do that. Years back I was asked to write a review of a book on positive psychology. and uh, provide a Buddhist take on the topic. And what I noticed was that there was no consideration of the different ways that you could find happiness in terms of what the impact would be on your own happiness for the long term and also the happiness of other people. There's more how people found their kicks, how people found their pleasures, how people find deeper pleasures in life than just sensory pleasures. They did focus on that. but. To be objective, quote-unquote, the author kept saying, well, we can't think about the, the morality of the way people find happiness. We have to look at simply the fact of happiness itself. So that's where I took issue with the book. So you've got to consider the, consider the consequences of people's actions. It was interesting. The editor of the magazine who had asked me to write the review said they were very surprised that that was the approach I took to it. And I kept thinking, what other approach could you take? You have to think about the consequences of your actions, and you're responsible when you do, when you act in a way that doesn't harm anyone. That's really significant. That's something we should learn how to appreciate more and more. There is room for individual expression. You'd look at the different perfections, and generosity in particular. There are lots of different ways you can be generous. And the Buddha placed no constrictions on them, simply that you not harm yourself or harm others in being generous. But even though, when he was asked by King Vasanity, where should a gift be given, the king was expecting to hear, as he heard from the Brahmins, a gift should be given to Brahmins, and from the Jains, a gift should be given to the Jains. He was expecting the Buddha to say, well, give to the Buddhas, but the Buddha didn't say that. He said, give where you feel inspired. You feel the gift will be well used. And as for what you want to give, he didn't place any restrictions on it. He said, if you want to make generosity into a skill, then there are other considerations. You have to think about the attitude you bring to the gift. You want to be attentive, have respect. The attitude you have toward the recipient, you want to have respect. Your motivation, 
giving anything from hoping, well, I'll get this gift back someday. Or by being generous, I'll get other people who like me. But then from there, the motivation can rise. That this doesn't seem right, that I have something and other people don't have it. I have enough to share, I should give. Does somebody think generosity is a good thing? The more refined your motivation, the higher the results. Then there's the gift itself. You want to make it. It's good to give something that's timely. In other words, you don't give scarves in the middle of summer. And the recipient, as the Buddha said, the, the best recipients are those who are free from greed, aversion, and delusion, and those who are practicing for that purpose. The other people who make the best use of the gift. But all this is optional. It's up to you to decide how much skill you want to bring to the gift giving. And you're perfectly free to decide what kind of gift you want to give. Whether it's a material thing, gift of your time, give your gift of your knowledge, gift of forgiveness, gift of your energy. The Buddha wanted to emphasize that the freedom in generosity is where you really first sense your own freedom of choice. That's what the teaching of karma is all about. You do have freedom in the present moment. There may be influences coming in from the past, but there's still this freedom. You can choose to do something skillful or something unskillful, given the situation. In fact, the situation itself is shaped by your actions right now as much as it is, or if even more than things coming in from the past. There may be some things you can't change coming in from the past. But when the Buddha explains causality, your intentions in the present are actually prior to your experience of the six senses, which is where you sense old karma. So what's your, what you're doing right now is really important. And there is that element of freedom there, because it is prior. So when the Buddha talks about karma, principles of skillful and unskillful karma, he starts with generosity, because that's your first experience. When you first really give a gift because you want to, not because you have to, that's your first real experience of freedom. You could give in to your anger, you could give in to your greed, but you don't. And he wants to underscore that. This is why the monks have the rules about when someone comes and asks, where should I give this gift, the monk says, give where you feel it would be well used, give where you feel inspired, or be, where you feel be well taken care of. That's it. You can't say, well, give to this group, give to that group. The monks have to respect the freedom of the donor's choice. That's one of the main lessons of generosity. So that's the area in which you can exercise your creativity, the gifts you give to the world, whatever self-expression you want to have in the, in the practice. That's the area where the self-expression is best, best exercised. But when it comes to other areas of the practice, you don't have to keep on reinventing the Dharma wheel. What the Buddha taught about concentration is still true. What he taught about mindfulness is still true. All the teachings in the Noble Path are true all down the line. These are the things we want to keep in mind. This is the duty of mindfulness. We're talking today about all the different things you keep in mind, or you could keep in mind. But it's good to start with the ones, with the teachings that the Buddha said are categorical. On the one hand, the teaching that skillful action should be developed and unskillful ones should be abandoned. And then from that you can derive the Four Noble Truths, the duties for comprehending suffering, abandoning its cause. The cause there, of course, would be an unskillful action. Developing the path, which is a skillful action. Then realizing the cessation of suffering. Everything you need to know lies under those duties. That's the main framework you want to keep in mind. 
And as I said, staying with the breath, staying in the present moment, trying to keep the mind as still as possible, helps you access your memories of what worked and what didn't work in the past, or what you shouldn't be, shouldn't be, should or shouldn't be doing right now. When the mind is running around, it can't access things. It's like having a big set of drawers. So when you're still, you can reach out to all the different drawers. When you're running around, the drawers over here, but you're over there. You can't access them. This is why we try to stay with the breath, be alert to the breath, and then alert to whatever else is coming in the mind. Because when you're with the breath, all four frames of reference are right there. Feelings come up, they're right there with the breath. You try to decide, is this a feeling that should be developed or one that shouldn't? The same with mind states. And the question is, how do you get feelings and body and mind all together so that you're aware of the whole body and a sense of well-being that fills the whole body? When I was in Singapore recently, someone was raising the question, well, what is this business about spreading breath energies to the body? And the Buddha never said anything about breath energies. Well, a lot of things the Buddha didn't say about the practice. He sketched out the main outlines, and it's for us to fill in the details. And the part where he says when you get the mind to settle down, it's a sense of well-being that comes with being with your object. Then you spread that well-being through the body, the sense of pleasure, the sense of rapture, the fullness. But he doesn't say how. This is where John Lee's teachings on spreading the breath energy are really useful. They give you some ideas to explore on how you can be spreading this energy around. So you can have body, feelings, and mind all together right here. Then when things are out of balance, you can access those, the different lists of dharmas that he has in the fourth frame of reference. You're dealing with the hindrance right now. Okay, what do you do with hindrance? When mindfulness and concentration come up, what do you do with those? If something is a cause of suffering, then you abandon it. If it's something is part of the path, you develop it. So the Buddha's giving you things to put in those drawers. Then, of course, you add things to the drawers by your own experiences. So when you're right here, they're all available. Something comes up, and you can remember what to do. And if it's something brand new you've never experienced before, well, you watch it for a while until you learn how to recognize it. This way the mind comes more and more together, that spot we're all, we're all aiming at, which is a really satisfying and a totally blameless happiness. This is what brings us together, regardless of our background. That was one of the things I really appreciated when I was with the John Ford, is the, the sense of extended family. People of all kinds of backgrounds. And I was part of the family. And John Fung had said he wanted me to, me to become 100% Thai if I was going to study with him. In other words, being a Westerner was never going to be an excuse that I couldn't do this, couldn't do that. But beyond that, there was a large acceptance. So we could learn from one another's differences, but we could also learn from the fact that we had something in common, that we realized that the source of our suffering wasn't this group or that group outside, it was here inside. And that brought us together. So we start with our separate ways, start with our separate places, but the practice brings us together. So we can do something that really is significant, train the mind so it doesn't keep wandering around, creating trouble. So it can find the ultimate possible happiness and imposes on nobody at all. <laughs>